What is up, fellow nerds, and welcome to Not Your Status Quo. My name's Doug, and today we're going to be discussing The Mandalorian Season 2, Chapter 10, The Passenger. I'm Keith, and remember, if you like what we do here, please like this video and subscribe to our channel. And I am Dave, and if you don't want to be attacked by a horde of alien spiders, hit that bell to be notified of future videos. Chapter 10 is upon us, and while some may call it a filler episode or a side quest, there was a whole lot that actually went on during this episode. So let's kind of dig in, and we'll start with, hey, you know, Mando leaving uh, Moss Pelgos, coming back, and he's attacked by a bunch of bounty hunters. Now, were these guys looking to get the child for Moff Gideon, or they were another crime syndicate? We don't really know, but there's a lot we can theorize on. Yeah, I have a feeling this is going to be like an ongoing issue that Mando has to deal with, um, you know, constantly running from all of these other, you know, crime syndicates or bounty guilds or whoever else is wanting to get their hands on the child or who knows, maybe I'm just even want to steal his armor off his back. I mean, he's going to probably have to deal with this no matter what star system goes to or planet he's on. I feel like by this point. Um, much like a lot of the, you know, characters in the Star Wars universe, people are going to know who he is and what he's got. And I like how uh, the beginning of the show, um, when he's very first riding onto the scene, it's a lot, it's still um, very Western. And he's riding up uh, out of the out of the horizon. You can see the two stars to know, the two suns, I mean, to still know that he's still on Tatooine. And the guys that, that jack him, um, they, I think, you know, I had seen them in the background at uh, in Return of the Jedi, the, not the actual, uh, characters here but the species were in Jabba's palace so you know that they're bounty hunters coming to get them and that they um they even mention when they knock them out they know it's him they're not just ra uh randomly trying to rob somebody because they the first thing they say is get the child you know uh when they were getting ready to set up the trap I was sitting there thinking like um you know a 50 50 coin flip is how the, how the sh this show is going to actually ha actually uh, handle it. Um, sometimes I wonder if they're going to allow uh, Din to be able to notice the traps that are coming up and be able to react to them, or if he is going to be, you know, uh, downplayed a little bit and actually uh, be ambushed or whatever. Like uh, we kind of noticed this in the second episode of the first and so I suppose this is actually fitting for it to be in the second episode of this one. But uh, when he was uh, basically going after the uh, the Jawas to get the pieces back to his ship, uh, you notice that he didn't always hit every shot. Uh, a lot of them were, uh, you know, getting him off of their uh, off of their caravan, and he was actually having to put up a decent fight in order to, uh, you know, stay on board, not lose a child, and things like that. And when it came to this episode. I was sitting there watching them lay this tripwire and I was sitting there thinking, okay, is he going to see it coming? Is his scanner going to pick it up? Is he going to notice it like out of the corner of his eye and, you know, quickly adjust and then take them all out or how are they going to play this? And you know what? I would have been happy with either instance uh, just because it's cool character development regardless. And I really like the idea that, Hey, you know what? He's still human, I guess. Uh, whatever the Star Wars equivalent for uh, a human type species is. And he totally falls for the trap, uh, goes flying, you know, probably should have been injured, really. And like when he flies off the bike, he um, he uses his back or his jetpack to uh, stabilize him so he lands correctly. But if you notice, he's still using his arm uh, control for that. Um, I remember when he got the pack and they said that um, he would... Um, have to grow you know the, the pack would have to learn him before he could do it fly it without using his uh remote so i thought that was interesting how he stabilized himself yeah you know you're both you know you're both right i think we're going to see din growing in the years and seasons to come well, he's going to be a little more on the lookout for traps i think his uh inexperience kind of led him and got that trap i think as we go on in this uh, show it's going to be less possible and I, I agree with dave it was subtle that they had him working his wrist to handle that because we didn't learn from the armor when he got it that one day he'll be able to basically you know be able to control it without the wrist thing so it's nice they're not forgetting things that were said in earlier seasons and it's carrying on and and things we liked i love the fact that you see him carrying the armor and everything else back to town 
to, you know, go uh, see Amy Sedaris, the wonderful Amy Sedaris, who had some great lines in this episode. And who was she sitting with but Dr. Mandible. And for those of you that don't know, Peyton Reed directed this episode, who has directed Ant-Man and Ant-Man and the Wasp. So it was a nice little nod he threw in there to his prior films. I thought it was rather enjoyable. I like it when he, he's crossing the desert and he's, um, you can see how far he has to walk. And he's still, you know, he's a, he's a badass Mandalorian. He's carrying everything instead that the speeder bike was carrying. And he gets, you know, he gets in there. And uh, I love how they're still using the same cantina, same boots and everything from A New Hope. Yeah, uh, that was actually a really nice touch. I uh, I enjoyed seeing um, her sitting in the same seat that Han was sitting in in the cantina. I thought that was nice. Um, you know, I've heard of there being several recreations of that cantina um, spotted in like a couple of different places in the United States. I think the Not Your Status Quo crew should go and visit one of those. One thing I also noticed that um, when he gets into the cantina and he finds Pelly, um, she's playing Sabak and she actually wins with the hand, um, the Idiot's Array, which is the same hand Lando um, win, wins uh, in a game of Sabak on uh, Star Wars Rebels. We do find out that the Dr. Mandible does know where some other Mandalorians are, and he'll give them that information. And it takes Mando to his next stop. Unfortunately, he's got to take a passenger with him. And there's a couple of caveats. To this trip that he has to abide by. It is a frog person, and hearing Amy Sedaris do the frog voice was pretty amazing. I thought that was great. And of course, as soon as I saw this character, I'm like, oh my God, we know Baby Yoda likes to eat frogs. So what path are we going to lead down? And as soon as we find out, he can't go into hyperspace because she's carrying her eggs and it's the last of her line. I was like, this is not going to go well for everybody. And it didn't. Her name is Frog Lady Keith. Okay, get it right. Absolutely. My apologies, Frog Lady. I didn't mean to get your name wrong. But, you know, we do, you know, we kind of talk, I kind of talked about this at the beginning. This is kind of a filler episode, kind of a side quest. If it is kind of gaming, it's kind of a side quest of this because as he's flying out, you know, he gets stopped by Dave Filoni and the New Republic X-Wings because he doesn't have his transponder on. And that leads to uh, some amazing flying by Mando to kind of, well, get away temporarily from this, from these X-Wing pilots. And another thing about this encounter with the X-Wing um, uh, fighters or pilots is that, um, you know, Mando is trying to say anything he can to get them to go away. And at the end of their conversation, Mando says, may the force be with you. Now, we, all, we already know he doesn't know anything about the force and, it, and he just uh, has the baby of a race of uh enemy sorcerers so he doesn't know what the force is so i'm thinking it's just a way to say you know have a nice day or whatever post empire um that they don't really know what it means when they say it kind of like uh, an answer to the church prayer may the lord be with you um the pilots actually answer back and also with you so i thought that was kind of funny and can i just say how disappointed these starfighters uh pilots must be the fact that they're basically relegated to um like interstellar cops at this point like uh oh hey uh that guy's signal is out we better we better pull him over and check for his id and insurance it's like i mean it, you know you go from fighting in this galactic war taking out tie fighters like oh yeah man i was in a real bad dog fight and uh next week well yep i uh, wrote three tickets and also involved in this chase is, um, you know, when Mando is found, um, uh, well, later on in the episode, I guess, when they have, when they're out there talking to Mando and they decide to let him go, um, during that conversation, they they mention some episode, some um, events from last season, the Bill Burr episode where he uh, took the um, the three who uh, took him on that mission and left him in the New Republic. Uh, transport that um, when they brought that up he doesn't say yes I did that when they say uh, is this true he doesn't say anything all he says is all am I under arrest that's great humility um, I think he will he's showing all over this show when he can they can bring people together and he's not going to take credit for um, his accomplishments he's just a great leader 
No, you're absolutely right, Dave. We even talked about it last week, how he's not only growing and, you know, being a bounty hunter and being a dad, you know, I think we saw that a little bit this episode with him, you know, chastising the wee baby Yoda or the child uh, when he was eating the frog's eggs. I mean, really the last of this uh, family's line and Yoda's kind of eating him. But, you know, he's growing in pretty much every aspect of his, you know, being. And it's really well done. He's even becoming a better pilot, I think, when we saw him unfortunately crash the ship on that planet that wasn't Ilum, that wasn't Hoth. Great trailer, you guys. You had everyone talking that it was going to be a planet that we already knew. But he crash lands, the ship is damaged, he's trying to fix it up, and Frog Lady kind of leaves the ship and goes and finds a hot spring. Baby Yoda and Mando end up following her, and they end up into almost a horror film, if you will. Yeah, it kind of reminded me of... Um... A the alien series uh, where the egg hatches and uh, it you know, comes flying out and attaches to your face and our aliens, the second one where they just kind of go in the and they open them themselves. When uh, Yoda gets up there and he eats the spider. And of course, like an alien that, that activated the rest of the spiders, they all woke up and they came after him. I thought that was a nice homage. And can we agree that Din really needs to, if he's going to be the child's father figure, he's got to discipline that kid. I mean, he's just going around eating everything, eating these endangered species eggs nonstop. Like, how many times did he catch him doing it? And in fact, like, uh, what a misuse of the force. You see him concentrating and using the force to get the eggs closer to him so he can eat them. And then he ends up unleashing all this. But, like, I mean, spank that kid. God. You know, Doug, you make a good point. He is, but he's he, he's growing as a father. He's going to learn that he's got to, you know, a little more discipline with baby Yoda, we baby Yoda, because, you know, he's doing things like this. And, you know, I'm, I'm really shocked that the mom didn't realize that a bunch of eggs were missing and that maybe baby Yoda had put on a little weight. You know, we do get this wonderful sort of uh, chase scene with the spider and we see Mando doing what Mando does best. You know, he's throwing some charges to try to get at the thing from following it. He's blasting, you know, small and medium-sized spiders left and right. The whole time I'm thinking, how is he going to get out of this? And, you know, they finally get back to the ship and they're fighting and they're doing all that. And lo and behold, as Dave said earlier, someone comes to save them by blasting these spiders. Now, I don't know about you two. My first thought was it was Boba Fett. And I was like, oh, he's been following them and he's going to save the day and maybe he's going to win the armor back. So I was very happy to see that I was wrong because I thought it was a nice touch that, hey, those guys didn't leave. They knew he was around there somewhere and they ended up finding him and saving his life because I think Star Wars is always done showing, hey, the New Republic are the good guys and they're going to save people. Even if they might think they're a criminal at heart, they're still going to try to save them. Uh, jumping back to the spiders thing, um, I, when I first saw that, too i i did think of aliens but i thought like i was thinking harry potter and uh lord of the rings like at the same time uh but um i guess in the star wars universe they have had uh spiders uh, attack before if you watch star wars rebels kanan um is actually walking through the desert when he first loses his sight and he has to navigate through uh giant spiders called krikna yeah, you know, Dave, uh, that was an excellent Rebels episode. They were surrounding the base. They actually had put things up so these spiders wouldn't be getting into the base. And that actual spider, the queen spider that we saw in this episode, was actually from a Star Wars art book uh, that uh, Ralph McQuarrie had written or had drawn. So once again, you know, John Favreau and Dave Filoni are reaching out to all of these other different, you know, Star Wars movies and shows and cartoons and anywhere they can get their hands on and bringing stuff into their show to make it better. And I really, I really like the fact that they're really, you know, not everything has to be new in their own. They're reaching out and using other people's ideas when they fit and they're good. You know, so he is saved and Dave had talked about earlier, we do, you know, find out that they looked up his plates or whatever. I think they said they ran his tabs, which goes back to, you know, Doug, uh, your turn signals out, we got to pull you over. They're definitely, uh, I don't think they want to be cops, but they said, hey, you know, we know what happened. You try to save that uh, New Republic guy. You captured three other criminals. And I like, he goes, what if I forego my bounty? <laughs> I was like, OK, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So I will say this. About it. Um, I agree that uh, you could technically view this as a filler episode. But I think when it comes to episodes like these, sometimes they are necessary 
because it kind of gets us from one point to an- to another. And um, I don't think they should have taken the whole, you know, like 45 or however long minutes that this was. Maybe this one could have been one of those 28-minute uh, episodes or something like that. <clears throat> They probably really didn't need that much. There wasn't that much in the way of storytelling that really happened in this particular one. But um, I still think it was necessary. Um, Probably not the greatest one. I'm not going to immediately say that it's probably the worst. It was fine Um, because uh, there was a a few in the first season that I was a little iffy about as well. I love every episode of the first season. Um, I think I, uh, I dislike a lot of portions of the... Um, the prison escape episode that one was uh, it was okay in parts it had a couple of funny moments but I didn't really like the entire thing I kind of felt like that was a filler episode uh, too um, because it was really just kind of like out of nowhere all of a sudden he decides oh I need some extra cash uh, but yeah kind of like in the same way here it's like uh, his overall mission is to find another Mandalorian so he can hopefully get help finding these enemy enemy sorcerers and I am going to laugh when he finally puts two and two together and figures out that the magic hands is the same thing as the force that's in that saying and he's going to be like oh that's what that means <laughs> I'm sorry I am waiting for that but one thing that I uh that I noticed in this episode. And uh, this kind of ties back in a little bit to what Keith, Keith and Dave thing um, just about a uh, uh, Din's character really. Um, so at one point we uh, um, frog lady actually utilize uh, the old um, alien robot uh, voice modulator in order to talk to, Din, talk to Din. And um, she mentions that he has to save her because it's the creed. It's all about the creed. And you see him like, struggling and be like oh god she's right oh it's a creed i have to actually rescue her i've to save her and you know that's something that's just not going to change about him i don't see it ever happening i think that that's such an important element to who he is as as a person that uh first off i think it's amazing that other characters actually know about the mandalorian creed but i think it's really awesome that you've got that moral compass that he's always going to stick to so you know if somebody calls him on it and says hey what about the creed he's gonna be like fuck you're right yeah i guess so yeah and and a couple of things in this episode as well um the child you know baby yoda whatever you want to call him we just um he shows that he's not just cute but he's a handful he just he, he likes to cause trouble i mean but if you think about it when luke first met yoda he was just causing trouble uh left and right in the dagobah so um I guess his hunger outweighs the future of the series, the, the species, I'm sorry. Uh, and not the series, but, um, you know, another thing about the show, just like an Easter egg, um, the, the voice of the bartender was actually, uh, Mark Hamill. So boom. But, um, anyway, uh, the other guys haven't rated it yet. I'm going to go ahead and get my rating right now. My rating would be 7.5 for this episode. I thought rating the last episode a nine, would give me room to rate this one a little bit better if it was and it just wasn't it was a drop off it was the closest thing to a filler episode you'll find on the mandalorian but i still like um like doug was saying i think that some of these shows are necessary because when when you're going through life and you're going you have a goal and you're trying to reach it you know there are things that happen along the way that might not directly influence what you're doing so you know and it might have a little learning experience in here for mando that he could use later on and you'll know and now you'll be you'll be able to look back and know why he did what he did so we don't know you know i can't read the future but um overall i'm going to give it a 7.5 all right i definitely agree with dave i definitely think the quality is a little bit drop off from episode one but episode one was so incredible i should have anticipated that and you know i definitely think this was a filler episode but i don't mean that in a bad way i mean i think it did push the story forward a little bit because mando knows where a planet is with some other Mandalorians, so that's pushing that story forward, and he gets sidetracked on his way, but it also ties into the prison episode with not only the droid Zero, our hero Zero, uh, at least the frog lady talking through it, but we also, you know, part of the reason he is let go by the New Republic is because he captured those three three soldiers, or three criminals, and he also tried to help the New Republic, you know, officer that was on that prison ship. So they're tying things together. I think it was a drop off, but I mean, 
the cinematography in this episode was absolutely amazing. I think Peyton Reed did such a great job with that. I don't think he had a lot to work with, and I think he did a tremendous job with that. And, you know, th just the little scene with the bounty hunters at the beginning, because like Doug said, or Dave said, I can't remember which one of you said it, this is going to be a reoccurring thing, because I'm sure that bounty for the wee baby Yoda is huge. So every bounty hunter, every bounty hunter in the galaxy is going to be looking for him. So, you know, it was good, wasn't great, but I would take this over most other episodes of, uh, you know, other shows. I really think it was good and I'm looking forward to next week, but I'm with Dave. I'm going to give this a 7.2 out of 10. Yeah. You know what? Um, you know, this uh, doesn't happen that often, but I think the three of us are, are pretty much um, in agreement. Uh, you know, this time around, we all pretty much felt the same way about this particular episode. It was fine for what it was. It was a I'm getting from one place to the next kind of episode. Um, I guess filler is appropriate, but uh, yeah, I'm going to agree with Keith. That's not really a negative term. Um, it wasn't as action packed. It wasn't as amazing and, you know, up to the same standards that uh, the opening for this season was, but it was fine for what it was. Um, I'm probably going to rate it a seven out of 10. Um, I am glad I am glad that they didn't, uh, you know, immediately put Boba Fett back into this episode because I think they're sticking to their guns. This is not the Boba Fett show. This is all about a completely different Mandalorian. You know, let let that kind of sit for a little while. So I'm fine that they didn't immediately throw him into the action. That was perfectly fine. I am glad that they're also using this opportunity to show that the uh, the cute wee baby Yoda isn't as cute and, and wonderful and as uh, sweet as he was portrayed initially in the first season as he uh, swallowed a complete frog hole. Now that we know that he literally has no control over his stomach and he's willing to cause trouble like uh, his adult counterpart uh, did, um, uh, possibly worse. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I can't wait to see like uh, what ends up becoming. A I can't wait to see if uh, Keith is correct in the fact that um, not only is, uh, you know, Din becoming a better pilot, a better leader, but maybe he'll become a better father figure, hopefully, and uh, God, beat that kid, please. Oh, Lord, need some discipline. But uh, yeah, what did you guys think about this episode? Did you, uh, you know, sort of write it off as just another filler? Did you think it was great TV? Or, uh, you know, did you think it was eh, just average? We want to know what you think. So put it down in the comments below and uh, interact with us. Like this, uh, like this video and um, watch the rest and we'll see you for the next one.